Good evening. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease, and I'll give you fair warning that I'm a little under the weather. So if I start coughing, I'm going to reach for my water. So forgive me for, for doing that. Let's see if I can run this. Oh. All right. So let's start off with some basics about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is actually named after a physician. He was a surgeon by the name of James Parkinson. Um, interesting, I actually put this slide on there because I thought it was fascinating how he was a surgeon, a, an apothecary, a geologist, a paleontologist, and a political activist. So he didn't have enough to do with his life, but then, you know, um, talked about Parkinson's disease, and that's where the name has come from. Um, the name came when he wrote this essay on the shaking palsy. So he started describing people who came in with a tremor, a shuffling gait or walk, a stooped posture, sleep problems, and constipation. And initially, he gave the name of paralysis agitans. And then later, he renamed it, of course, Parkinson's disease. Why not name it after you? That's what I would do, right? <clears throat> so what is Parkinson's disease? You'll hear a lot of people talk about it. Just, you know, so-and-so got diagnosed with it. It's a progressive, meaning it gets worse as time goes on. It's a neurodegenerative, neuro, meaning involving the nervous system. Degenerative, again, getting worse as time goes on. Disease, and interestingly, it's the number two most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's. So it's actually something that you will run across um, you know, at some point as far as somebody having this condition. It affects over 1 million people in North America, and men carry a much greater chance than women. The lifetime percentage is a 2% chance if you're a man, and a 1.3% chance if you're a woman age 40 and older. And if you're less than age 50, you're less likely to get diagnosed, because as you get older, the chances of getting diagnosed are, are, is where it happens. And no area of the world is immune to Parkinson's disease. It's more concentrated in the industrialized nations, but it is there across the world. You'll see the orange and the red have the higher concentrations per 100,000 of a population. So we're looking at Canada and the United States. And I'm not really sure quite why that is, but that's the statistics as of, I think, 2015 is where this came from. So we were just talking about how you're more likely your percentage of having Parkinson's is higher at older ages. So the average age at diagnosis is 60. And some interesting ages, and we've all heard about Michael J. Fox. He was 29 when he got diagnosed, which is pretty amazing. And Muhammad Ali was 42. <laughs> so these are some very notable faces that have Parkinson's disease or have had Parkinson's disease. Other notable people with Parkinson's disease that you might have heard about, Alan Alda, Neil Diamond, Billy Graham, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Janet Reno. She's interesting because she was diagnosed just two years into her eight-year service. So she still served as Attorney General of the United States for six years after a diagnosis. Um, and then Linda Ronstadt actually just made the news lately because of her struggles with Parkinson's disease. So, a lot of famous faces as well as, you know, everyday faces that you'll come across with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease, we'll talk a lot about here shortly, gets confused with other things. Essential tremor is one of the main things it gets confused with, but just because you have one condition doesn't give you immunity to not get something else. So you can go your you know, entire young adulthood and get diagnosed as having an essential tremor, but you still are fair game for Parkinson's disease. So 20% are the statistics of patients with an essential tremor. That's a tremor that comes when you're trying to do something. So if you were going to thread a needle and your hands shake, that's more of an essential tremor. Essential tremor is more hereditary. Usually you have a first degree relative that also has that kind of tremor but you're still fair game for Parkinson's. So 20% of an essential tremor go on to develop Parkinson's disease. And then there are some medications that can put you at a higher risk for Parkinson's type symptoms. Um, interestingly, vascular. So if you have a stroke in just the right area or you have a lot of strokes, you can actually have Parkinsonian symptoms. And the most famous face behind that was George H.W. Bush, who um, died. He actually had vascular Parkinsonism. 
So it's not true Parkinson's disease, it's because of all of the strokes in the vascular. There are atypical Parkinson's um, things you might have heard about, particularly one with Robin Williams was Lewy body dementia. <laughs> it's actually something that has Parkinson's type of symptoms, but the dementia and some of the other symptoms are what's dominant. And so um, he actually had confirmation that he had Lewy body dementia. So there are a lot of other things, other diseases that can act or look like Parkinson's disease. So what's the problem with Parkinson's disease? So in 1919, it actually got written down or it actually, um, they discovered the fact that there are nerve cells or neurons in the center of the brain in the area called the substantia nigra. And these nerves over there lose the ability to produce dopamine or the nerves <coughs> die so the dopamine is not formed as much. So officially, it's the loss of these dopamine-producing nerves in this central stock of the brain that is part of the problem. The other issue, the other thing that comes up when we look at it with the microscope is that there are these clumps called Lewy bodies also in the stock of the brain. So I just talked about how you lose these dopamine neurons in this area of the midbrain. And so the dopamine neurons, I think I have a pointer to this. Um, I do, okay. So the dopamine neurons you can kind of see are this area, uh, they stain black when you look at it. So this is actual tissue from the stock of the brain. And you can tell how this area is not as dark as a normal, healthy adult's brain should be. Here's another picture. This is normal, nice and dark when they look at it. And then this is a individual with Parkinson's disease that doesn't stain as dark because those nerve cells are, are lost. Dopamine is very involved with communicating between nerve cells. So in a normal adult, you should have lots of dopamine going through and communicating between nerve cells. In someone who has Parkinson's disease, you're not going to have as many of those dopamine chemicals because the nerve cells are just not there. So it's almost kind of like I describe it as though all the stores in the mall are starting to close. There's just not as many of those nerve cells. So we don't have as many of these stores making dopamine. And so you have less dopamine with Parkinson's disease. When you lose about 60 to 80% of these dopamine producing brain cells, you start having symptoms. So we go quite a ways. We have that much of a reserve that we can get by, but by the time 60 to 80% of these nerve cells are lost, then we start having symptoms. I said the second half of the problem is the presence of these Lewy bodies in the stock or the brain stem of our brains. And so what they have found when they look under the microscope for a patient who has Parkinson's disease is that there are these clumps of protein. I think I've lost my mouth. Oh, there it is. Um, there are these clumps of protein um, that are found in the tissue of the brain. And that particular name of that clump is called a Lewy body. And that protein that it's got is called alpha-synuclein. And so if you go into the medical literature, you'll read a little bit about how there are a number of conditions that can have this alpha-synuclein and that can have this Lewy body. But the basic issue is that it's building up in the stock of the brain especially. And the brain cells, if you have all these clumps where they're not supposed to be, the brain cells don't talk with each other very well. And then you have problems. So in Parkinson's disease, we lose that dopamine. We also develop a bunch of clumps. So nothing is working the way it should. So when the Lewy bodies are in the brain stem, in the stock of the brain, then the functions that that part of the brain does starts having problems. So Patients often can have constipation and depression and sleep issues because we're having trouble in this part of the brain. So 
like I mentioned before, the importance of dopamine really came to light in the 1950s, and we figured out that's the key to Parkinson's disease. In the stock of the brain, in the area called the substantia nigra, in the right in the middle, we're losing that dopamine, and the brain doesn't have as much of that chemical. So the majority of cases of Parkinson's disease are sporadic. I talked about essential tremor a few minutes ago where I said most of the time there's a family history of that particular condition. In Parkinson's, most of the time, there's not a strong family history. There are patients that do have Parkinson's that run in the family, and they've recently come up with a few of the gene sequences that can contribute to a family genetic tendency. But the vast majority are just sporadic. It just happened, you know, somebody got diagnosed, it just happened. It wasn't because there was a family history of it. But if you're going to have a genetic link, there are a few things. If you're less than age 30, we worry that it's hereditary, that there's a genetic issue. If you are part of the Ashkenazi Jewish population, there's a strong hereditary population that um, has a higher tendency toward a variety of conditions, Parkinson's being one of them. These are um, Jews that settled in and around Germany and northern France, and you can kind of see on the map of Europe where the Ashkenazi Jewish population generally is located. And if you have an affected first degree relative, it's a little bit higher risk that maybe there's a genetic issue. Statistically, they say 20 to 25 percent of patients with sporadic Parkinson's disease may have at least one first degree relative with Parkinson's. And if you have a first degree relative with Parkinson's, you might be 2.3 times as likely to develop Parkinson's. So we do ask about family history. I ask about family history, but uh, it's in general, it's not a strong link. So what else is a risk for Parkinson's disease? The highest risk is the older you get. But there are some other risks. Heavy metal exposure, if you're exposed to pesticides or well water, woodworking, head injuries, rural living, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. And protective, statistically, is cigarette smoking. Not that that's a reason to smoke, but <laughs> for some reason we have found that individuals who smoke have a, a less likelihood of Parkinson's disease. Um, coffee and caffeine seem to be protective, and so we still don't know, understand all of that, but that's what they found. Farmers and Parkinson's disease, something very important to us here in the Midwest, are more prone to Parkinson's than the general population. And uh, one of the ways they discovered that is a, a um, substance called MPTP. So in the early 1980s, a bunch of people showed up in the ERs in California with Parkinson's symptoms. They were unresponsive, they were rigid, they were tremoring. And when they tried to figure out what was going on, they found a rogue chemist who is manufacturing this synthetic heroin from a lab. And these people were injecting it. And because it was, you know, kind of the side job that this guy was doing, he was getting this chemical or impurity in this synthetic heroin called MPTP. And the MPTP was causing symptoms as though someone had advanced Parkinson's. Well, when they looked, they found that MPTP was a structure that was similar to a herbicide that was being used. And uh, the one in particular was Perquat. So in 2000, there was a confirmed link between pesticide exposure and increased risk of Parkinson's disease. In 2006, they followed people for nine years and they found that people exposed to pesticides had a 70% higher risk of Parkinson's, which is pretty impressive. So in general, the herbicide Perquat ups the Parkinson's risk about two and a half times. But there are other herbicides and fungicides that they're thinking are also involved. But at the end of the day, all the research is pointing to the fact that it's not one thing. It's both genetic and environmental factors that can work together in order for you to be at risk for Parkinson's. 
This is one of the main things I want everybody to remember. Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis based on symptoms. And that's hard for us as doctors. It's hard for you guys as patients. It's hard for my family members because we all want to walk into a lab or we want to walk into an x-ray and we want to say, I want to know, is this my absolute diagnosis? But it's a clinical symptom. There are motor symptoms. There are non-motor symptoms. So motor symptoms involve movement. Non-motor symptoms are not involving movement. And we'll go through a lot of these. The first group of things that we're going to talk about are the motor symptoms. And the acronym to remember that is TRAP. So there's a tremor at rest. There's rigidity. There's akinesia or bradykinesia. And there's postural instability. And so well, let's talk a little bit more about some of those. The first symptom of Parkinson's disease that we'll talk about is the tremor at rest. So it's officially a rhythmic oscillation or a movement around a fixed point um, when you're at rest. So when you're just sitting there relaxing, watching television, not doing anything versus an essential tremor, which is often what gets confused with Parkinson's by some um, friends and family and doctors is when you're trying to do something. You're trying to thread a needle and your hand shakes, that's more of an essential tremor. If you're just sitting there not doing anything in the evening, resting, and you see someone's hand shake, that's more of worrisome for a Parkinsonian type of tremor. So, and it's also a pill rolling tremor, um, kind of a back and forth oftentimes of the thumb and forefinger. I'm gonna try and minimize this and show you the video, see if I can do that. Is there an end show? I need your help. Oh. And let's see if I can find it. I, from the American Academy of Neurology, did we lose it? So I just want to show the Parkinsonian type of tremor. You can see it when this gentleman walks down the hallway with the shaking. So he's not trying to do anything. His arm's just by his side. That's a Parkinsonian tremor. So let's go back to the presentation here. Usually, yep, it starts with one hand. Ah. So it's the first symptom in most patients 70% of the time. And at some point, most Parkinson's patients, 90% of them will have a tremor. And usually starts on one side. And that side usually becomes the most severe when it does spread. So. Most of the time, as the disease progresses, you may have tremor in other, in on the other arm, the other leg, both legs. But oftentimes, the one side that started it becomes the most severe side. And it can involve not just the arms, but the legs, the lips, the jaw, the tongue, but rarely the head. We'll see the jaw, but if the whole head shakes, that's more of an essential tremor, not a Parkinson's tremor. Tremors usually worsen with anxiety, with emotional excitement, or stressful situations. So, you know, when you come into the doctor's office and you're showing the tremor, most of the time it's going to, it's nice for me because it's usually going to be more amplified or it's going to be stronger than if you were just at home with your family members. So that's good because I get a chance to see it when it's under stress. The second symptom of Parkinson's, that's one of the primary symptoms, is rigidity. And rigidity is the stiffness, and oftentimes by someone it can be pain. When you're walking down the hall and the arm's not swinging and it's by someone's side, they have uh, sometimes a stooped posture, they've gone from what I describe as being a noodle to a stick. You know, you're, you've lost that flexibility, you're tight. When you're trying to move a joint, it's rigid. It's not moving as well to passive movement. And it's present in about 90% of patients. It can affect any part of the body. It also usually begins on this one side, usually the same side as the tremor. 
and eventually spreads. The kind of rigidity we describe is what's called cogwheel rigidity. So it's almost like you have a ratchet and you're trying to move it. It, it gives a little bit. Versus the other kind of rigidity that's out there in medicine is called lead pipe rigidity, where it's just a solid rigidness. It doesn't ratchet and move. Third symptom is bradykinesia or akinesia. That means either you're slow in your movement or you, akinesia means lack of movement. It can occur when you're starting to move or if you're trying to keep moving. And most of it is what really bothers people. And eventually it involves most patients who have Parkinson's disease. So you will see as individuals are trying to um, go from the hallway into a room, it's, their brain is trying to get the feet to move, but they just can't move. And it's part of this issue um, with the bradykinesia and the akinesia. Sometimes if you're talking to someone who has Parkinson's disease, they act like they don't hear you because it takes them a while to answer you. And that's also the akinesia, bradykinesia. It's not that they're not understanding you. It's not that they don't hear you. It's just the movement with what their brain gets out to their lips to actually talk and respond is slower. Everything slows down. And oftentimes, someone who's suffering with Parkinson's disease will describe it as weakness or incoordination or tiredness. In the arms, with the bradykinesia, the movement is slower. So especially in the fingertips, it's hard to button clothes. It's hard to um, click on a mouse or type or um, lift things from a pocket or a purse. In the legs, the steps can become shorter, more shuffling. You feel more unsteady. The slowed movement also can cause difficulty standing from a chair or getting out of a car. And as the slowness can worsen, you can freeze. Like I just mentioned, as you're walking from one hallway into a room, it's like the legs just don't move. Um, there also may be something called festination. A festinating gait is when somebody just can't stop their movement. And so it almost looks like someone's running because Again, their brain says stop, but their legs are not following through as quickly. So on the examination, you'll see us as doctors say, tap with your finger for me, open and close a fist for me, or open and you know, turn your wrist. Those are all ways that I test to see if someone's um, speed of movement is what it should be. So if you're just mildly bradykinetic, it'll just be a little bit slower, especially on the side that's having more problems. But as someone progresses, the movements on both arms, both legs, can become much slower and less coordinated. The last actual primary symptom of Parkinson's is the postural instability. So that means it's a feeling of imbalance and a tendency to fall. It usually appears a little bit later. And I test it in the office with what's called a pull test. So I have someone stand, I say, get your balance, and then I push someone backwards. And I say, you know, how much of how much can you control your balance? So a normal person will maintain their balance or take one step backward when they're pushed. Someone with Parkinson's disease will take multiple steps backwards or won't be able to even keep their balance and fall backwards. So this is one of the most problematic, most troublesome parts of Parkinson's disease because if you're falling a lot, you're more likely to fracture something, you're more likely to have other issues, and this is one of the main things that causes the progression into a wheelchair and disability. And it's also, unfortunately, the least responsive to a lot of the treatments that are there. So we just talked a lot about the primary symptoms, the motor symptoms. There are a lot of secondary symptoms with Parkinson's disease, such as decreased arm swing, or eye blink, or masked face, or the voice volume being softer, difficulty turning, shuffling gait. So, one of the main things that are noticed by friends and family of someone with Parkinson's is that they stare or they have a masked face. They don't seem as animated with conversation, and that's a medical term for that is hypomimia. 
Individuals can have some trouble swallowing, have trouble with drooling. If you don't move your mouth as much, the secretions build up. It's almost like going to the dentist and saying, keep your mouth open for a while. Well, they have to keep suctioning you because you, it's not that you're making any more saliva when you go to the dentist. It's not like a Parkinson's individual is making any more saliva. It's just they're not moving their mouth as much. So that saliva builds up and you're more likely to drool. There can be trouble looking up. There can be trouble with eye opening, eyelid opening. Small handwriting, that's another common complaint. I can't write as well as I used to. The stooped posture is very classic with Parkinson's. Difficulty of turning in bed, shuffling, short gait, freezing. These are all other motor symptoms that are involved with the disease. So we talked about all of the motor symptoms. Let's talk about the non-motor symptoms. Things that you and I can't always see when we look at someone. There are psychiatric symptoms, there are sensory symptoms, there are sleep symptoms, there are autonomic symptoms, and other symptoms. So the non-motor symptoms, symptoms that are not involved with motor, come in about 97% of patients. So as doctors, we really have to ask and pry and dig because it's not something that people will always link together with Parkinson's. They'll tell me about the tremor, they'll tell me about the difficulty with walking, but they won't tell me they're not sleeping well or that they're not feeling as hopeful about life. And especially in the psychiatric domain, it's very common because dopamine is one of the key chemicals involved with our emotions. I always tell people, you know, there's a reason why the marathon runners want to keep running marathons. Well, it's because the dopamine is released more in the brain for the athletes. And so they get this dopamine high, makes them feel good. So then they think, oh, 50 miles, that wasn't too bad. Let me run another race. So in individuals who don't have as much dopamine, and like we talked about, that's the key problem with Parkinson's, then depression becomes a real issue. And it's the most common issue with Parkinson's. That's a non-motor symptom. Certain non-motor symptoms can come well before the motor symptoms are actually visible. So things like smell dysfunction and constipation. When your body is slowing down and gets rigid, well, the gut gets rigid too. So all of a sudden, you start having more and more issues with constipation. You have more issues with sleep and depression. So all of these things sometimes statistically can come up to 10 years before someone actually shows the physical motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Excessive daytime sleepiness is present in 33 to 76 percent of patients. And it can have many causes as part of the Parkinson's issue. It seems to be more common if you're a male, um, but the argument is that it's also not just the medicine. Sometimes we blame, oh, you're giving me the Parkinson's medicine is causing me to be sleepy. It's not really the case. It's usually a combination of the disease itself, and it could be some of the medicine, but a lot of it is just a disease. Autonomic dysfunction can be a part of Parkinson's. And so what is autonomic? Autonomic means stuff that we can't control. So how you sweat, we can't turn on the sweat and we can't turn off the sweat in our body. We can't turn on how our blood pressure is regulated and how it isn't. So one of the things that can happen in someone with Parkinson's is something called orthostatic hypotension, meaning the blood pressure isn't able to regulate when you go from sitting to standing, and all of a sudden, when you go to stand up, gravity pulls the blood down. You can become lightheaded and faint because the body's not regulating quickly like it used to because we've slowed everything down with Parkinson's. Constipation, again, it's not something we can control whether our bowels move at the right speed, and so that becomes an issue. Incontinence and heart reflexes can come as part of this autonomic dysfunction. Smell, sweating. Other non-motor symptoms, fatigue is in 33 to 58%. When you're having to shake a part of your body, that's exerting a lot of energy in itself too. So you're tight, you're rigid, everything takes more work. 
And so some of it can be related to the progression of Parkinson's. Sometimes it's also in general because of the disease itself. Again, a reminder that Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis. It's based on all of these symptoms. So how do we actually start with the diagnosis? How do I start with the diagnosis? The first main thing that someone has to have is bradykinesia. So if you're running around this room like a toddler, I can highly doubt if you tell me you have Parkinson's disease. You've got to be slower in what you do. It's part of the chemical issue going on in the brain. And then you've got to have at least one of the following. So you don't always have to have a tremor, but that is one thing on the list. You don't always have to be rigid, but that is one thing on the list. You don't always have to have that postural instability, but again, one of the things on the list. If you're not stable, which is postural instability, it can't be because you can't see, or you've got a stroke, or you've got neuropathy. It's got to be on its own. You're not stable. Step two is I got to make sure nothing else is going on. So if you have lots of strokes, well, it's got to be, uh, you're more likely to have a vascular issue, maybe a vascular Parkinson's, but not the true blue Parkinson's disease. If you've hit your head many times, if you have other issues, if you have a severe dementia and then you start having Parkinson's type of symptoms, it leads me to think you don't have the classic variety of Parkinson's. Of course, if you have a brain tumor or too much fluid in the brain, which is hydrocephalus or too much spinal fluid, again, I've got other things that are probably causing symptoms. Neuroleptic, whoops, neuroleptic medication are uh, medications that are often used for psychiatric disorders. So in schizophrenia, you actually have too much dopamine. So some of the medications that are given for schizophrenia, they lower dopamine. So if you give for years for schizophrenia, sometimes you can start looking Parkinsonian because you've been on medicine that's forced your dopamine to be less. And so I have to make sure that's not what's causing your symptom. The other thing that's a red flag for me is if I give you one of the main medicines for Parkinson's and you have no response, I worry that I don't have the right diagnosis. So what about imaging? You'll say, well, you told me it was a clinical diagnosis, but I heard there's this test out there. There's a um, brain scan. There's a SPECT scan. There's an imaging test called the DAT scan that was, uh, that was approved in 2011. So basically, they take this radioactive isotope and they, they try to see how much dopamine is in the brain compared to what they would expect for a normal person. And so we look to see if the problem is dopamine, then a brain with Parkinson's should have less dopamine than a brain that does not have Parkinson's. So it does help in differentiating a Parkinson's disease from an essential tremor, but it doesn't tell me different varieties of Parkinson's or if there's an atypical form. So it is helpful, but it's <clears throat> not a confirmation because it, even though the sensitivity and the specificity is high, meaning 87 to 98 percent of people, it's relatively going to tell me what the dopamine looks like. It's not foolproof. <clears throat> and so when I'm not 100 percent sure on a diagnosis is when I start ordering things like a DAT scan. And here's a little bit of a look at a DAT scan. So a Parkinson's patient versus a normal control. So in a normal control, you've got all of that dopamine nice and bright. On a Parkinson's patient, you can see how there's really not much there. So they give you this isotope, and then a few hours later, they do some scans, and they look to see how much dopamine supply is there in the brain. The treatment of Parkinson's is what we'll talk about next, is symptomatic. So from the very first few slides, I said, this is a degenerative disease. It gets worse as time goes on. And at the moment, the tragedy is we don't have a cure. So everything is trying to maintain 
function and to help with symptoms, but at the end of the day, I still don't have a cure. <coughs> there are three strategies that I use for treating Parkinson's disease. One is pharmacologic, meaning with meds. The second is non-pharmacologic, without meds. And the third is surgery. The pharmacology or the medication approach, we try to do two things. Manage the symptoms and try and protect the brain as much as possible so things don't get worse. So when do I treat? When it becomes something that affects the dominant hand. If your livelihood is to be on a computer and you can't hit the mouse button as quickly as you need to to keep your job, I've got to figure out a way to help you maintain your job and maintain function. So to the degree to which the disease interferes with your work, your daily activities, or your leisure function, or if you're having a lot of problems with slowness and walking, I've got to figure out how to help you. And so we have these categories of medication that are used for treatment, levodopa, MAOB inhibitors, dopamine agonists, COMT inhibitors, anticholinergic agents, and amandadine. So I have all of this to choose from, and uh, periodically from time to time you'll hear of a medicine being approved in one of these categories. The main treatment, the still the gold standard, still the best drug is levodopa. It's been around, it's the oldest out there, it's been around for a long time. And it's still, despite all of the advances that have come out, it is still my best medication. Because the goal of treatment is to get your brain, get anybody's brain more dopamine, because that's our problem. And so, levodopa, <coughs> down here, if I can see a mouse, gives your brain back the dopamine. It doesn't make your brain work for any of it, it just gives it back to you. And so it is still the most well-established drug it responds, it treats the slowness, the rigidness pretty well. Tremor, it does a pretty good job, but sometimes some people don't respond as well. And then the postural instability is not as responsive. There was a lot of <coughs> controversy on levodopa for years, whether giving the drug too early would worsen the disease would make you immune to dopamine, and uh, the statistics, the data at this point don't indicate that. The treatment actually helps someone stay more active, helps someone stay more engaged in life and routine, and it's actually worth taking the medicine. The disease is gonna get worse on its own. The goal is to help quality of life. <laughs> levodopa comes in many forms. The most common form that's used, or the first variety that I use is the actual tablet. It comes in an immediate release, comes in an extended release, and we had an extended release out on the market for years that did a terrible job, but now we have a new extended release that's been out probably five or six years that's doing a much better job, the Ritari. Um, there's an orally disintegrating. If there's trouble swallowing as part of the disease, that helps. There's actually an enteral, meaning if you look down at the diagram, there's actually a peg tube or a feeding tube kind of tube put in directly into the gut. And there's a device that helps get that medicine directly into the gut. So you don't even have to take it by mouth. You can have um, this, this pump, this Duopa pump implanted with the tube and you just carry around a cartridge and that gives you the medicine. Um, so that's uh, within the last 10 years, that's one way to get the medication. There's also an inhaled variety, same drug, and it's just inhaled um, for times where there is an off time where you don't feel like there's as much dopamine or the medicine's wearing off, you can do the inhaler. Common side effects to levodopa is nausea, drowsiness, dizziness, headache. Serious side effects can be confusion, hallucinations, delusions, agitation, psychosis. We talked about how if you have too much dopamine, you can have schizophrenia type of symptoms. So if you get too much levodopa, which is really the dopamine being replaced, you can have some of those same kind of symptoms. There's also a slightly higher risk of hip fractures because there's a chemical called homocysteine that can go up a little bit, and that can put someone at a slightly higher risk. 
at the end of the day, I don't really even focus on that because I want someone moving better. If they're going to not move very well, they're going to be rigid, they're more likely to fall. So if I had to choose between giving someone levodopa or worrying about the slightly higher risk for hip fracture, I would rather you move. So it is something that's out there, though. After being on levodopa for a number of years, you can have what's called motor fluctuations, meaning the drug seems to wear off faster. When you first take the medicine early in the disease, it kicks in within a half hour or so, depending on which form you're taking. If you're taking the tablet, the classic form, within a half hour to an hour, it kicks in. It lasts four hours. At the most, you get six hours. It wears off, and then you take your next pill. As the disease progresses, as you've been on levodopa for a long time, it's like your body almost gets immune to it, doesn't respond as quickly, or it responds, it peaks, and then it wears off. If it responds too quickly, instead of kicking in in a nice, slow, even amount into your body, it can all of a sudden surge in your body and can give you involuntary movements known as dyskinesias. So when you see Michael J. Fox moving sometimes on television and he's doing all of this squirming movement, that's not the Parkinson's, that's the dyskinesia from the medicine or treatment that he's taking. So that's when he's got the medicine in his system and he's been on these meds for so long, he was diagnosed at 29, that, that the effect of the medicine is not a nice smooth build into his system, it just peaks in his blood system and then gives him those side effects. But most Parkinson's patients don't care about dyskinesia because they want to be able to move. So they can tolerate the abnormal movements because it means that they're looser, they're more limber, they're able to get around. You can also have abnormal cramps and postures known as dystonia. Typically the dystonia or these abnormal movements are when the medicine's wearing off. The next category of drug is the MAOB inhibitors. And the basic issue with this particular class of medicine, I keep having this diagram because these, the goal still is getting as much dopamine into the brain as possible. So not only do we want to get the brain dopamine, we also want to keep that dopamine around. So our body is always producing this chemical and it's always breaking down old chemical. So a lot of these drugs work on trying to avoid the old dopamine from being um, picked up and it's almost like put out to the garbage. You want to hold on to that dopamine even if it's not as strong for as long as possible. So this particular class of medicines tries to avoid the breakdown of the dopamine into other chemicals. So trying to keep that dopamine as much as possible. We talked about levodopa which is just giving you back the dopamine before. So, like I mentioned, the, levodo the MAOB inhibitor prevents the levodopa from being degraded in the brain, limits it from being collected, almost like avoiding it going out to the trash. And there's three different medicines out there, selegiline, resigiline, and safinamide. Safinamide is the newest drug on the market, meaning March of 17, uh, but they all do virtually the same thing. The Resigiline was initially thought to be neuroprotective. Some of the early studies that came out said that if you treat for a year versus someone who doesn't get this medicine for a year, the advancement, the progression of disease is better for someone who's been on the medicine. But as the years went on and more and more research came on the scene, that theory kind of got wiped out. So there was a time when the new data came out that I would put a lot of my young Parkinson's patients on as elect or acidulene, and I've quit doing that now because if the data's not going to hold to it, I'm not going to put another drug into someone's body unnecessarily. Side effects can be nausea, headache, insomnia, confusion. Third class of medicines that are actually very commonly used are dopamine agonists. So these drugs try and get the brain to make its own dopamine more. So I always tell people it's almost like you're yelling at the factory, come on, make more, make more of what you've got. So you're not just giving the body back the dopamine, you're not just preventing it from being broken down, but now you're encouraging the brain to make its own, make it more. So they stimulate these dopamine receptors, so you produce more dopamine, and there are drugs out there called, um, actually I spelled that wrong, it should be Pramipexil, not Ramipexil, 
But pramipexol, ropinerol, ritigamine, bromocryptine, um, there's an injectable form. Um, the brand names to some of these, uh, Requip is ropinerol, pramipexol, that's spelled incorrectly, is Mirapex. They are used for other things. You'll see them for restless legs as well. Um, the, a lot of the treatment can sometimes cross over. But these are all in the same category. They're encouraging the brain to make more dopamine. So it often is used in someone who's young, who's early in their diagnosis, because we think, OK, if you already have those nerve cells, let's see what we can do to maximize these nerve cells and maximize how much dopamine these nerve cells are producing. Instead of just handing you the dopamine with the levodopa, Let's encourage your brain to make it itself. The side effects are similar to the levodopa, but you do have a higher risk for edema. You also can have some withdrawal if you suddenly stop it. But there's a key side effect that you'll hear about, and that is increased risk for compulsive disorders. So I've had patients who enjoy gambling every once in a while, who all of a sudden now on this medication cannot go buy a casino without going in and spending large dollar amounts of money. Um, and we stop the medicine and that gets better. So I always warn my patients that you are at a higher risk for compulsive behavior. If you're someone who enjoys your dessert, all of a sudden you want to eat three desserts at every meal. or so, you know. So anything that um, you might enjoy may get taken to a maximum. So you have to be aware of it. Other class of medicine called COMT inhibitors. These are medications also that help keep that dopamine around a little bit longer. I don't think that's on that. Oh, they're down below. So it's also helping to keep the dopamine from being broken down. It's another pathway in that. So it reduces the breakdown of levodopa, keeps the dopamine around as long as possible. It's something, though, that can't be given by itself. It doesn't work very well by itself. So you'll see it in combination with the levodopa. And it often tries to keep the medicine around in the body longer. So if you take medicine three times a day and all of a sudden you feel like, you know, an hour before your next dose is due, the medicine is really wearing off, I will often add this on there to see if I can get you to that next dose comfortably. It may increase those unwanted side effects of dyskinesias. And then it does come with a lot of possible side effects. I'm very cautious in my senior adults. If you're over the age of 70 or 80, I'm very careful. I usually don't add the medication because I have more of a risk for hallucinations and confusion. <clears throat> Interestingly, it can turn your urine orange. So if that happens, it's the medicine. <clears throat> Another class is called anticholinergic agents. These are the original drugs that were on the market to try and treat Parkinson's. We hardly use them anymore. If anything, we'll use it in younger patients because, again, lots of side effects that I don't want. Confusion, dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation. I already have to deal with some of this with the disease. I don't want to add to my problems. And then amantadine. Um, it's actually an old, old antiviral medication that we use for several things. We use it in Parkinson's nowadays quite a bit. And we also use it in multiple sclerosis to help with fatigue. So you'll see it used for other things, but it's actually an antiviral medicine. We have no idea how it works, but we do know that it helps keep people from having unwanted side effects and keeps the dyskinesias down. Um, so if you have the dyskinesia, so when you take your dopamine or the levodopa and all of a sudden you start squirming, then we add the amantadine and that seems to settle that issue down. And there is a long-acting formulation that's recently come on the market. So it's being prescribed quite a bit now. We also use it if you're having that pathological gambling from that other medication, that dopamine agonist. Sometimes that issue can go on even after we stop the agonist medicine. So sometimes we'll add this drug to try and get rid of that issue, at least get the body out of that habit. We talked about earlier how drooling can come as part of Parkinson's. There are medicines and treatments that we do for that aspect of the Parkinson's. Again, symptom relief, that's a very bothersome symptom. It's hard for someone to go out in public with friends and family if they're profusely drooling. And so we do have treatments for that. Non-pharmacologic treatments. So um, we work on education, especially when you're coming to the office with me. 
as to what's expected, what's not. Sometimes it's hard to fight a battle if you don't know what you're up against and what, how you can help overcome some of these things. Speech therapy, one of the issues with Parkinson's disease sometimes is the voice can get softer. And so there is speech therapy, the loud therapy that helps with improving that. Physical therapy, exercise therapy, there's a big and loud program that's the actual nationally accredited program. We actually do offer that locally. And so trying to really work on the issues that are at hand for Parkinson's disease. And we have also found that people who have good, strong exercise programs actually slow down disease progression. Because you remember my marathon runners are helping their dopamine by running their 50 mile marathons. So if you as an individual with Parkinson's are exercising and trying to get your brain to secrete its own dopamine, it's helping keep you from progressing as quickly. So I'm very strict about exercise with my patients. I'm, I'm always harping on what are you doing? How are you moving? What are, what are you into? Otherwise, you get a ticket to the Big and Loud program for physical therapy to try and help kickstart that. It's a multidisciplinary-ish um, treatment for exercise. And then nutrition-wise, um, high fiber diet, constipation is a huge issue with Parkinson's, so we don't want that to um, be ignored. Hydration helps part of that. Avoiding huge high fat meals can kind of slow down the gastric process and interfere with the medication absorption. So if you're going to eat high fat foods, try and reduce the quantity or break that up. There is some question about protein. In general, I have no objections with protein in my Parkinson's patient. But in some cases, I am very aware of what they're on. So if you're on regular levodopa, the medicine needs to go in before you eat your protein or drink your protein. So you need to take your levodopa 30 to 60 minutes before you eat. And creamer and coffee, any kind of meat, all of that slows down the absorption. But you're not restricted, you just have to time things properly. If you're in advanced disease, sometimes I have to worry a little bit more. No evidence for vitamin E, no evidence for other um, antioxidants at this point. We don't have a true neuroprotective agent at this point, meaning protecting the nervous system from the Parkinson's. And surgery. So, 2002, a stimulator called the Deep Brain Stimulator got approved for Parkinson's disease. And it's the most commonly done surgery for Parkinson's disease. So there's an implanted battery in the chest. I have lost, there it is. And it's wired up into a lead that goes into that central area of the brain either the thalamus or into that midbrain section where the dopamine isn't being produced as well, and it's delivering an electric shock or a stimulation into the brain, again, trying to get as much dopamine out as possible. So it also helps with movement and helps with um, the tremor. The tremor responds remarkably well to the deep brain stimulator. So there are people who have a significant shake or tremor and they can't take a lot of these medications because they're getting um, bad side effects or they're maxing out on dosages and still not getting good control, then we'll move on to actually the electric surgery, the deep brain stimulator to try and control symptoms. So another picture um, of the actual deep brain stimulator and the wiring. Um, this is what we do in the office. We will interrogate that and adjust the settings. We do that here locally. I do that um, in the office and we can actually set it so that it can um, be adjusted depending on the progression of the disease. We know that the Parkinson's is going to get worse as time goes on. So with the settings we can actually adjust it to take account for the fact that the disease is going to progress. So it's used for patients with fluctuations. Sometimes they're on and they're doing great. Sometimes they're so stiff and rigid. They have potentially have a lot of side effects to medications with the dyskinesias, or we're not able to control that tremor even after using large doses of medicine. We'll go to the stimulator and the surgery. If there's no response to the dopamine through the levodopa, 
or if there are significant memory problems, we are not going to put someone through brain surgery. We don't want the exposure to any of the anesthesia or anything else if there's other issues. And if you don't respond to the dopamine, we've got a problem because we've got to figure out, do we have the right diagnosis? We certainly don't want to give you brain surgery and put a stimulator in if we're not 100% sure things are going to get better after surgery. So if you respond to levodopa, that's something that I can then consider surgery for. But if you don't respond at all to getting more dopamine, then I'm not going to go recommend surgery for you. There's a risk for brain surgery. You could have bleeding in the brain. You could have infection. You could have wire breakage. So it's certainly not the first step in treating Parkinson's disease. Um, and it's not something that we take lightly. All right, thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Um, the, um, you mentioned hallucination. Does that normally come as Parkinson's progresses or is it part of the medicine? Both, so as Parkinson's gets more and more advanced toward the end stages, hallucinations can become common, but it also can be related to the medication, depending on what medication. So every category but the levodopa has a risk for hallucinations. The lowest risk for hallucination is in the levodopa. No, no effect on the pituitary, and it is in the middle of the brain, but this is the substantia nigra and the um, pars compacta. That area is actually the upper part of the stock of the brain. Our brain is kind of like, I always tell people, our brain is like broccoli. We've got the big top part and a stock, and so this is right at the very top of that stock. Okay, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a reference of 4 to 6 hertz on the tremor. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify, is that cycles per second limit? Oscillations, yeah, and we don't ever measure it, but it, it, there are some fine tremors that are like this, that's not a Parkinsonian tremor. There's got, it's, it actually looks like this, that's the four to six hertz. Other, oh, uh, one more question. Sure. Uh, PHD, your views. Well, officially, the um, data is not there yet. And part of the issue with that is we don't have consistency with concentrations. So with epilepsy, there's actually been a drug now out on the market with the active ingredient so that they can have some consistency of dosing. Because it's hard to do a true clinical trial if consistency, concentration, dosing is not there. So there will be case reports and people say, I have a great response. Um, you will even hear people say, I'm cured, but that's not ever going to be the case because right now we don't have a cure. Will it help some of your symptoms? Maybe. I just don't have the data for it. So I'm not recommending it. The other thing you have to be really careful about is it is a chemical you're putting in your body. Even if you put sugar into your body, you have to be careful because you can affect other medications. And we do have issues with interacting, somebody is super stable on their medications, all of a sudden they start something like um, CBD oil or something else, and now all of a sudden their meds are not working as well, because there are drug interactions, even if it's a natural substance, you have to be careful. So just talk to your physician or provider before you decide to head down that path. Thank you. Sure. You mentioned, uh, Sri mentioned head injury. Do you think that's what sort of caused Muhammad Ali? Absolutely. You, you um, get knocked in the head enough and damage the, the nerve cells that are producing that dopamine and you get symptoms. Yep. So he wasn't an idiopathic Parkinson's, meaning his didn't just happen bah, because it happened most likely because of all the head injuries that he had. Yeah. It's worrisome. You know, the boxers are a little bit higher risk because their head is constantly getting a brunt, you know, the brunt of that. Um, but absolutely, you know, we, we don't know what that's going to lead to. 
you know, I think we're recognizing Parkinson's more and more because we're all living to be older. So maybe all these athletes, if they only live to age 50, may not develop it and you don't even think about it. But now that we're living into our 70s, 80s, all of a sudden we're seeing it. And so we're recognizing some of the side effects from the football injuries and the concussions. Mm -hmm. Yep, or volleyball or, you know, there's a lot of things that we forget about sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So literature wise out there for medicine says repeated head injuries and they tend to focus on the boxers, quite frankly. Uh, but you're absolutely right, the soccer players. And I don't, I don't know if they've just not done a specific study looking back at that group for whatever reason. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe in general they don't play as long professionally. Nowadays they are, but, you know, maybe that's why. I don't know. But you're right. <coughs> Any other questions for Dr. Fletcher? What, a, what about the mentally impaired? Mm -hmm. I, I do have Parkinson's, so I would, you know, think it's probably a couple of years. You know, both the last four hours, I was thinking maybe the four hours. But mm -hmm. Well, we know that if it goes inhaled, it, so in order for us to get the drug dopamine, we have to be able to get the dopamine into the brain. And there's a barrier called the blood-brain barrier that is a huge gate that stops a lot of medication from affecting the brain. And we know that if it's an inhaled form, it's able to go through the tissue and the, and the mucosa and the nose and actually it, it has a direct shot into the brain a lot easier than if you swallow it, has to go into your gut and then get absorbed and go up into the brain. So we use it a lot for people who are all of a sudden having lots of off times where it's like they don't get the effect from the medication and they'll use the inhaler, the Embrigia, and then get back to being able to walk. It's just super quick is why that's effective. We used to have an injection form that people could use too and over time it didn't pan out and had other side effects but so far this is looking pretty good with the inhaler. old age as we all get older our risk well not not to be offensive I'm just saying as we all get older our risk for neuropathy increases um, you know the number one issue with neuropathy is diabetes 60 percent of people who have neuropathy are diabetic and so as we get older we get some of those other conditions Parkinson's you're at a higher risk for developing Parkinson's as we get older so the uniform unifying issue is older age but no, there's no direct link that we know about because totally different processes. Parkinson's is a dopamine brain problem. Neuropathy is a peripheral nerve in your toes, in your fingertips issue. So not connected by the way that the disease works. But yes, a very interesting observation. It's sad because the Parkinson's also causes you to have trouble walking and moving. And then if you have neuropathy on top of that, it makes it a huge challenge. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Have a good night.